Welcome to the Finding the Magic podcast, where books come alive. I'm Tricia Copeland, a fiction author and host of this show. If you love books, finding great reads, and hearing about the story behind the story directly from the authors, this is the place for you. Whether you like fantasy, science fiction, dystopian, or romance titles, I think you'll find something to love in my playlist. Listen in to discover something magical about a book or two today. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Trisha. Nice to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. Today we have Alexandra Beaumont. She is an author of at least two fantasy books that I know of that I saw on your website. And I'm super excited because I saw that you both, maybe one or both of your books are really rooted in folklore. And it's my favorite thing to just like dive behind the story and find out how you came up with the ideas, your roles, your characters, all of that. So where would you like to start? We could do a bit about the folklore. Um, Well, okay, well, first tell us about your books and then you can give us the background maybe. (laughs) Yeah, sure. It's never sort of sure on which way to go first, whether to sort of get people in with the folklore or talk about the books first. Um, But yeah, as you've said, Tricia, so I'm a folklore fantasy author and I've written two books. Um, One, Testament of the Stars, was my debut, and that's based on Tudor astrology, which I then turned into a religious system. And my latest one out is here, Distance of Birdsong. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And... As you might guess from the bird on the front cover, this is about um, bird folklore and it's set in ancient Cornwall, which is this really sort of coastal bit of the UK, um, which is very wild and battered by storms and that sort of thing, um, which is very apt at the moment because we're currently being battered by storms in the UK. Um, And it's about this society of people who inhale mist from the lungs of birds in order to survive but the mist is running out, so it's following the main characters, trying to find out why that's happening. I am super intrigued by both. Which one do you want to start on? Uh, let's definitely talk about dissonance, because that's okay. just come out, so it feels feels like the time. <laughs> Fun. So, and I saw on your website, these people are song weavers. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so the main character, Azeld, is a song weaver, which is quite unusual for her people um, because most of them channel this mist that I was talking about from the bird's lungs into sort of fire to sort of survive the harsh winters and that sort of thing. But Azeld has chosen something different. She's chosen to channel it into song, which she then uses to charm and weave situations to her will. So she's quite unusual from that perspective. But what I really wanted to do was weave in sort of traditional folk songs and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the basis for her magic, really. Neat. So, yeah, I was wondering if it was a little bit like Siren or Siren's Powers. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of that in there. Um, In sort of Cornish folklore, there's quite a sort of overlap, I guess, between sort of like merfolk and um, songs and that sort of thing. So it's definitely leaning into that space is all I'll say. Okay, so we don't want to say too much about that because it might give too much away. (laughs) Very much. Okay, so talk about how you had the idea for the birds and the myths for the birds and getting the power from the birds. Yeah, so I really love fantasy that tells stories of like symbiosis with nature and so what I really wanted to do was sort of link that really closely and there's quite a lot of of Cornish folklore which I based this on about a real sort of close link between humans and birds in the myth in the mythology of all of that so people believe that sailors who die get sort of their souls get carried away on the souls of birds and things like that and a lot of my ideas come from oh that's a really neat idea how could I turn that into sort of like a cultural belief system so that was sort of where I started really um and then I just daydream until it turns into like a fully fledged fantasy book plan (laughs) but so what I'm envisioning is that they're sitting in front of a bird and inhaling the bird's breath is that correct or no 
Yeah, pretty much correct. Um, so the birds migrate back to the nest where these people live in the spring and they essentially need to retch up this mist, which sounds unpleasant, but they essentially put the beak their beaks in the mouths of the humans to try and then like get this mist out. So if you imagine it's like a baby bird being fed, it's it's like that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So my spirit animal is a swallow, and I have I have the swallows. I have five swallows on my back, and I have this one, and I have one on my foot. So I am very much in tune with birds because I love the symbolism that the birds always go away, but then they always come to back home to nest in the same place. So that they're my spirit animal. So I was really intrigued by this book too. <laughs> That's that perfect. Is, that, yeah. Set us up with the main characters of the book and their plight and their challenge. Yeah, so I've talked a bit about Ezeld already, but one of the things that she's trying to do is um, save her sister, Nessa. Um, so they share a bird, which is again quite unusual, but they're twins. So they've got this really close bond, which means they share a bird. And um, when so when the mist come, runs out, and the mist starts to run out and they don't have sort of access to their bird in the same way as other people do anymore. Um, they're at risk of being sent to where's what's called the picking pits, which is basically this mine where anyone who's guzzled all of the mist from their bird gets sent. And so Ezeld's sort of quest, if you like, is to try and stop her sister having to be living in the picking pits or as an exile. Um, oh. So those are the two sort of main characters on the on the playing field, really. Yeah, and well, it would make sense if it was two people sharing a bird that the bird's mist might run out faster. Yeah. Um, do we know why her sister is in danger versus both of them being in danger? Is that I mean, both of them definitely are in danger, okay. but it's just as elder sort of, I guess, selflessly trying to save her sister. Her personality. Oh, fun. And so not everybody's in the society's birds are running out just their bird. Yeah, but there's more and more people who are starting to run out of mist, and so nobody really knows why. Interesting. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, you said a little bit of the story about how you came out with the book, like one thing led to another, and I don't. That seems to be how it is for me when I'm writing. So, um, yeah, that's very cool, very original. I don't think I've ever heard anything like that. <laughs> Well, hopefully not, because I'd be very sad if someone else happened to come up with it. <laughs> yeah, have you done, I mean, you live in the UK, have you, like, read all of the Cornish folklore that you can get your hands on at this point? Uh, like a lot of it, yeah, but, um, I mean, there's so much out there that you'll never know every tiny little thing. Um, yeah, I mean, and more and more like folklore fantasy is becoming more and more popular now so again can't like haven't read all of that but have read uh, a large chunk of it so yeah fine okay and is this set in present day like contemporary time or is it set in the it's, past or the future so it's um bronze age cornwall which is sort of the time where you have sort of like round houses and people are sort of starting to smelt with metal for the first time and things like that so yeah it's quite ancient <laughs> And did you have to do a lot of research about how they lived at that time? Um, yeah, a little bit. I knew some anyway, because it's a period of history that I'm quite interested in. So, But um, I went to visit some roundhouses and had a really cool talk in a roundhouse, actually, where they talked about how they lived and like how they moved and just used the space in roundhouses. Um, and they always say that you do all of this research and then none of it ends up in your book or like 10% ends up in your book. And I'd say that's true, but it does make it quite realistic when you right, do yeah, it. Yeah, I think it puts you in the mindset and gets you in the feel so you can see mm -hmm. it in your head and be able to describe what's in the world so that the readers yeah. are, are like transported into that space as well. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. It's, it's all the little details that get us there, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you'd be lost without the little details. <laughs> oh, yeah. How is it written in first person or third person? So it's in first person, which I actually really loved. Um, my debut was written in third, um, and I decided I was going to do first for this because I thought it was just so much more raw and close to the characters. And honestly, I think I'm never going to go back from. Well, I'll never say never, but I may <laughs> not go back from first person because actually I really love it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's funny because I always wrote in first person. I always thought it would be so hard to write in third person. And I finally did do one and I liked it, but I'm like, okay, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. But yeah, was it a hard switch in your mind or did it just kind of come naturally? Um, so I did start to write it in third. Um, and then I thought this isn't working. And then I, so I switched to first and rewrote like the first few chapters, um, to see if it worked. Um, yeah. And I just infinitely preferred it. And then the rest of the book just flowed at that point, really. Um, so yeah, it's so much as like, I've, heard, I've just, just finished my sequel to my debut, um, which I've now done in first person as well, <laughs> even though the first is in third. Right. <laughs> so, so is Dissonance of Birdsong going to be a series as well? Yeah, so um, I am currently sort of fleshing out exactly what I'm going to do with the whole of it, but I've got the sort of next few planned and I'm about to start writing that. Now I've finished the sequel to the other series. Um, so yeah, I'm loosely calling it calling it like the mist cycle which will be basically about more of what the mist can do in the world so yeah interesting yeah it'll, that would be neat to see like well do the birds I mean I guess the birds have special powers in and of themselves right and is it only for this one community or is it for the rest of the world too I guess we'll have to find out huh we don't know <laughs> I definitely do have some ideas, yeah. Um, but sort of what happens at the end of Dissonance of Birdsong definitely affects some of this, so I can't really say much. <laughs> okay, we won't have any spoilers here. The other book is called Testament to the Stars. Tell us about that debut novel. Yeah, so Testament of the Stars is, um, as I said earlier, based on um, Tudor astrology. So basically they believed that the star you were born under would set the fate of your life. And that's quite an unusual belief for what was a very Christian society, right? And so I kind of thought, oh, there's quite a lot of sort of scope in there for what that would look like if people believed in that as a religion. So I kind of started with that as an idea. It's also very sort of um, tapping into my love of Shakespeare because it's quite... It's quite dramatic, I think. There's like quite a lot of sort of treachery and star-crossed romance and things like that in it. So um, yeah, it, it's quite a different story to Dissonance of Birdsong in many respects in that it's a bit more like a built-up society and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, there's an element of kind of folk horror in both of the books that sort of is a, a tie across both of them, I think. Yeah, I mean... This one, um, Testament to the Stars, is sounding a little bit dystopian because it seems like you could create a religion where, you know, if you were born like in September, say under whatever star that is, mm. that um, if you wanted to deviate from that path, the people would be like, no, no, stay in your lane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. And like, there's very um, really set like beliefs about what you're going to be in life depending on sort of where you're born and things like that and quite a lot of the theme of the book is actually some of the characters rebelling against those set paths that they have in their life um so there's a lot about like fate and fighting your fate and deciding your own path and finding your freedom in it and what age characters are these is it an adult book or a YA book um so for testament of the stars I would say that's adult largely because it's quite politically heavy in some places as well so um yeah I'd say that's more adult dissonance of birdsong it's YA but with like heavy adult feel I think because like a lot of adults have read it and said oh I really loved this it was amazing it stuck with me forever type thing so um yeah but it's definitely sort of YA appropriate um okay. even though the character's not like as young as some YA characters tend to be Right. I love reading YA, so I'm always like, give me the YA books. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the main characters in Testament to the Stars? So there's three sort of point of view characters in Testament of the Stars. The first one, probably the main one, is Anya, and she's an astrologer who um, basically has taken the path of an astrologer of the astrologers to 
have the rights to wed the person she wants, who is Polska, who is from Rask, which is, so there's two settlements that are the main focus of Testament of the Stars, Jemind and Rask, and they're both right next to each other, but have vastly opposed views. Rask hate the stars, Jemind love the stars. And so you've got straight off with um, Anya and Tolska, like the star-crossed romance across the two settlements. Um, and then the third sort of main actor in it really is um, Anya's brother, Bree, who is, I can only really describe as an absolutely chaotic politician, like, he means absolutely well. He tries to do the right thing in everything he does, but he's often like too honest. So when he actually tries to engage with politicians who aren't as honest, he massively loses the game. Um, yeah. And so I love him from a very like aspirational perspective, but yeah, he gets a lot of stuff wrong, which then obviously causes a whole load of chaos for everybody involved. Um, yeah, I'm getting yeah. Romeo and Juliet vibes here. There's quite a lot of Romeo and Juliet vibes, yeah. Okay, fine. And again, is this set, I think you said, it's set in not modern times, right? Yeah, not modern times. I mean, this is a separate fantasy world as well, but I'd say if I was going to put a date on it, I'd say it's kind of like um, Tudor times, so like Henry VIII and beyond. Okay, yeah. So I love all those shows, Rain and yeah all of this <laughs> the tutors and it's like okay yeah they got into a little mystical fantasy a little bit with rain so oh okay cool have, have, have you that. seen that one no i haven't i have to look that up that sounds it's about that mary might... queen of scott i guess that's not really the tutors because the tutors was more in the uk because that's a, that one is about mary queen of scots and when she goes to france and marries oh, okay. king francis and then, um, you know, we all know what eventually happens to her, but she <laughs> was in between that before that. So I guess that's not really the Tudors. The Tudors were more, um, yeah, Henry It's VIII. kind of just after, I think, really. Right, right. Yeah. Fun. Well, what was your, I mean, you said you like folklore. What led you to write this first book? Um, I mean, I'd always, so my background's in English literature and I'd always wanted to write a book and during COVID lockdown, I was like, well, I've actually got time now, so I'm, I'm going to do the thing. Um, yeah. And I just, one of the things was I'd not seen a lot of books out there in recent times that were like big mainstream fantasy that had quite morally gray villains. Um, it's, always like well not always there's been more of a rise of morally gray villains recently I think but quite a lot of like books I was seeing was very sort of binary villains and I got a bit tired of it I didn't want like just oh yeah they're really evil and then there's like really good characters and really evil characters and there's no like spectrum between except in grimdark where that's a bit different but I wanted sort of a bit more of like less grimdark fantasy but still with nuanced villains and nuanced characters and so I thought I'm just gonna write that and see if I there's like yeah something I can do in that space. Fun well tell me about the villain in Testament to the Stars then is it is it the re religious system or is it a group of people or is it one person? Um so there's different villains there's quite a lot of different villains um two main ones um one is the astrologer elect in um Jemind who is sort of the head of the astrologers but he's not really he is a villain in that he's enforcing the system but when you get further through the book you understand why he's doing that in a way that you then think I think anyway sort of find a certain sympathy with him the more you understand who he is um, and then you've got the Queen of Parlenta, who is another sort of settlement who is kind of coveting other people's stars. And she's a bit more, I think, like stereotypically a villain. But even then, like you can kind of see why she would do what she wants, what she's trying to do. And I think that's the sort of thing really is like, I, I wanted all of the villains to be like, yeah, I can understand why they did that rather than, oh, they're just a, like evil dark one and they're doing an evil dark thing because they're evil type thing. 
Right. Yeah. It seems to me like if you take any group of people or any organization and they're following their their passion or their mission to the 100% that it can be followed by right? every rule, it's going to step on somebody else's toes from somebody else's mm. perspective. Like you have to, I mean, and the leader of that organization or that religion or whatever it is has to be 100% in because they're representing that. So really in their mind, you can see it, if you see it from their perspective, they're protecting a society or their way of life or their organization. And if they are like, oh, well, we don't have to follow that rule, (laughs) then, you know, that's a really slippery slope and everything's going to implode. So I guess, yeah, that's a good thing to remind people it's all from a perspective, different perspective. Um, Yeah. We we may be a little more out there, but. (laughs) Yeah. But I, th- and I think this is one thing that sort of like is quite easy to f- forget when writing villains is like nobody is the villain in their own story. Right. Everybody thinks I'm the hero of this tale, even the villains, right? Like nobody, well, maybe some people do, I don't know, but I don't think anyone gets out of bed and goes, ah, I'm going to do an evil thing today. <laughs> no, they're like, I'm going to do the thing that I know is right for me. <laughs> Um, right right yes and how much for me is in there maybe is the big difference yeah yeah fine yeah I was on a panel last week we were talking about monsters and about the same thing about perspective and you know and how you create that the valid monster versus just the purely evil being that has no like backstory or reason for doing this other than just being evil and those are the people and the characters that scare me the most (laughs) Mm. I don't want to believe those are out there (laughs) yeah that's true (laughs) so what is the second book that's coming out after testament to the stars in that series so it's called the astral tide and it's going to be a novella I'm just rounding up the story really um but it's quite sort of in that similar sort of Shakespeare vibes it's quite sort of high drama lots of different things happening um it follows predominantly Brie which was the brother that I was talking about because without spoiling too much at the end of Testament of the Stars he makes an absolutely massive mistake um and yeah this is going to be quite a short but punchy book of like the outcome of the mistake <laughs> and okay. him attempting to fix it but well his choices are like yeah questionable shall we say <laughs> did he become your favorite character um yeah weirdly I really like him <laughs> I don't know I mean and other people have said that to me as well that like he's one of their favorite characters I seem to have this trait where I will write a protagonist who's like I like the protagonists too, but then it's usually like the secondary characters that people are like, oh yeah, this like um, the sibling or whatever is the one that they're rooting for somehow. Um, so yeah, I quite like Brie. <laughs> well, I was going to say like Frodo, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or Sam, I guess. Like Sam. Oh, is- wait, is it, is it Sam is the one that's the, the second? Frodo is the main character, right? Do I get those? Yeah, characters? so it's Sam who's oh, like... Sam. The- okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Frodo. Yeah, so yeah, that kind of that kind of thing for sure. <laughs> yeah. So what other books or authors do you like reading or maybe inspire you? So I've got quite a wide range on this one actually. One of my favorite books, which I feel like I've talked about on every single podcast I've done <laughs> now, is um The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Safon. Um and that's a 1940s set kind of mystery I guess it's quite surreal it's got fantastical elements but it's not fantasy in the traditional sense but it's just the characters are so rich and it's kind of really gothic as well in the atmosphere of the city of Barcelona that he writes in um yeah and so that's that's one of my all-time favorites I'm reading at the moment um Lucy Holland's um Song of the Huntress which is kind of set in a similar sort of space to my book with similar kind of mythology that she's pulling on um and that's that's really enjoyable as well I could go on for ages with this but (laughs) yeah I've gone for a favorite and a current read (laughs) right well it's funny because 
you know, I traditionally like vampires and witches were the only mm -hmm. kind of fantasy characters I read. And then um, I saw a Sirens book and I was like, yeah, it's Sirens, they aren't really for me. But I picked it up anyway, loved it. Eliza Tilton, oh, um, Chris Farron wrote a Sirens book that I really like. Both of those are more YA books. Um, yeah, so I was like, oh, Sirens are cool. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, well, I could read lots of other fantasy characters. <laughs> opened yeah. up your uh fantasy broadened, yeah. something else, and yeah. like a lot of those are based on mythology so I brought in my background on mythology too. So it's always a good check off the list <laughs> yeah definitely it's always a good one and there's so much mythology out there that you can never really like run out of things so that's always good <laughs> I feel like that too this is a question that I love to ask my authors. Um, so you can answer about either book or both books, whichever you would like. But if there's one thing that you want your readers to take away or a feeling you want them to have from reading your book, what would you say that is? The dissonance of birdsong, it's definitely sort of overcoming hardships. Um, so one of the things that is quite prevalent that is um I wrote it when I was going through some sort of health struggles and that sort of thing um and sort of some of that's reflected in the main character's experiences as well but what I really wanted to do is sort of write a story about finding who you are despite sort of struggles and things like that so it's a bit of a sort of found family found self kind of self-discovery sort of trope in there as well but with a big backdrop of like when it's really hard you really need to try hard to like hold on to who you are yeah. um so yeah that's that's kind of the main thing I think readers will get from dissonance of birdsong and it, it's quite a universally applicable thing I think that a lot of people will resonate with yeah that, that those times in your life can be a big struggle and like sort of quote unquote pulling up your big girl pants and doing it anyway right yeah yeah absolutely trudging through well that's very cool that you could write that for inspiration because I think a lot of people go through those times in their lives and sometimes I it's funny because just the other day I, I don't know remember what I was feeling sad about but I started writing and I was like wait this character's not supposed to be sad let me rewind like she's supposed to be like on an up trajectory so sometimes it's sometimes yeah. good to get it out that way though isn't it yeah yeah so I don't know anyway I had to like reset and be my character <laughs> well I thank you so much for being on the podcast can you tell us where we can find you and your book yeah sure so um I'm on all socials as a Beaumont writer and then you can also find my books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and um the other places Waterstones if you're in the UK um I think it's on bookshop.org as well um yeah those are the main places and yeah if you're UK based I am going to be at a literary festival this weekend in Bedford and called Innsmouth Literary Festival and also I've got a few sort of bookshop events coming up which you can find on my website as well well, fun. Thank you very much for being here. And we'll definitely have you back when you write your next book. Yeah, I'd love to come back. And uh, yeah, it's just finished. So that probably won't be too far away. <laughs> well, thank you, Alexandra Beaumont, author of Dissonance of Birdsong and Testament to the Stars. Have a great day. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Finding the Magic podcast. I'm your host, author and podcaster, Trisha Copeland, and I love getting behind the scenes. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe and stop in each week, discover new authors and books. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep finding the magic.